And this will be Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8. And the heart of the earth is down in the ground. Uh, Ephesians 4, 8. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now he that ascended, what is it but he that also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? Now, all right, then there's two more. The first of these in Acts chapter 2, because Christ in the similitude said, As Jonas was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so must the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And the heart of the earth in Acts chapter 2, <clears throat> you'll find the location is hell. Uh, Acts chapter 2, verse uh, 20. Seven, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Verse 31, he seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither did his flesh see corruption. So though his body goes into the grave, his soul goes into hell, and hell in the pastures in the heart of the earth. Now come to Jonah chapter 2, and here's how you know that. Because the the illustration he gave was as Jonas, as Jonas was three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, in the whale's belly, so must the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. But look where Jonah was. Jonah chapter 2, verse 1. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God out of the fish's belly. There's his body. But then he says, I said, I cried by reason of mine affliction to the Lord. He heard me out of the belly of hell, not a whale. Out of the belly of hell cried I, there is his soul. So they're two different places. The way that thing works is you've got a this place they call Sheol, and sometimes hell is not the same thing as the grave. You get a thing like this. You get a thing where the grave up here looks lo look like this in Hebrew. That's called Kevarim, looks like that. A grave in, uh, in Greek looks like that, Nehemiah. Now, you don't have to know that to see what I'm going to say, but I only put that up there to show you there's a difference. Because this thing down here is called Sheol, looks like that. And this thing down here has one place called Hades, Hades. And another place we talked about last night, that message called Abraham's bosom over here, like this. And the statement is in, in uh, Matthew that the Son of Man has to be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He has to be down here. The body goes here. That's in the grave. And his flesh doesn't see corruption, but his soul doesn't go there. Uh, the body goes there. And then he says, Father, my hands I commend my spirit. His spirit goes there. Then his soul was not left in hell, his soul goes down here and comes through here and ascends on high and led leads captivity captive. So the statement is, he that ascended on high and led captivity captive is he that first descended into the lower parts of the earth. And his soul is not left here, it went up. All right, he said three days and three nights. Now that Jewish night begins in the evening. And that thing, you get that from uh, Genesis. And the evening and the morning for the first day. And the evening and the morning for the second day. And the evening and the morning for the third day. So a Jewish day doesn't begin at 6 o'clock uh, like ours does. A Jewish day doesn't begin at, at midnight. Now your day begins at midnight, 12.01, that's your day. That's a Gentile day. And you get that from the fact that in one gospel he says Christ was taken out to be crucified about the about the uh, ninth hour. That's nine o'clock in the morning. Another passage says there was darkness over the earth from the sixth to ninth hour. That can't be the same system of time. He's taken out to be crucified at nine. The darkness doesn't come three hours after he's crucified and occur at six. So obviously somebody using two systems of time. And one system of time is Roman time. When he says out about the ninth hour to be crucified, that thing is coming from 12 o'clock midnight. That's Roman. So he goes out there at 9 o'clock in the morning to be crucified. When he says there was darkness over the earth from about the 6th to ninth hour, obviously that's Jewish time, and that thing began at 6 o'clock in the morning. So 6 to six, the 6th sixth hour would have been 12 noon. So from 12 noon till 3 p.m., the darkness over the face of the earth. Now, you see the Bible has its own system and defines its own system. So uh, what, uh, what men think it says is immaterial.
All right, now because of that, our Jewish day begins with evening. All right, you have Christ, Christ crucified here on Wednesday. And he's crucified here on Wednesday, and then he goes in this tomb Wednesday night. That'll be Wednesday night. That'll be Thursday night. That'll be Friday night. That'll be Saturday night. And that'll be Sunday night. But the way that thing works is this Thursday begins 6 p.m. Wednesday. Friday begins 6 p.m. Thursday. Saturday begins 6 p.m. Friday. Sunday begins 6 p.m. Saturday. In February, when he says the first day of the week, he's talking about early in the morning the first day of the week. But well, that first day of the week begins 6 o'clock Saturday night. That puts Christ in the tomb all night. When Thursday night, all night Friday night, and from your standpoint, all night Wednesday night. Of course, that's the beginning of Thursday. Now that's one night, two nights, three nights. He's in all day Thursday, all day Friday, all day Saturday, which means he comes out of the tomb at 6 o'clock Saturday night. And that's why when the angels come in the morning, when the women come in the morning, they find the tomb, the, the stone rolled back and the angels sitting upon it, because in the middle of the night there was an earthquake. Now, the Lord doesn't roll back that stone, that tomb, to get out. <laughs> Obviously, if he went down here and came back up here, he don't have to push anything aside. I mean, he's going down here through metamorphic rock and igneous rock and sedimentary rock, God knows what. He don't need any stone pushed out of the way. The stone pushed out of the way so they can look in the tomb to see he's not there. So the thing is a literal three nights. One, two, three, and a literal three days. One, two, three, and out there. So my teaching is simple. My teaching is that the book says what it means, even it says. Three days, three nights. All right, something else. Yes, sir. And that story of Balaam in the, in the book of Numbers, uh, I'm a little confused on that. Here was a great preacher and a prophet. Uh, God spoke to him. He gave one of the greatest revelations in the Bible. Yeah, he did. Uh, he, and then in, in one of the chapters, uh, I think it's 23, he also says that the Spirit came upon him. Right. He's got to be living in some kind of an age of grace, right? He doesn't know the Mosaic law. Probably not. Uh, when he, Peter tells us he went to hell, yep. uh, he must have been living under some kind of an age of grace as a preacher that would but, uh, correspond to Romans 1 and 2, or not. Yeah, it's a Gentile thing, like wondering, uh, conscience. I type of grace, uh, I know you can't lose your salvation uh, in, uh, in the church age, but I'm just wondering uh, what happens to preachers who don't preach what God tells them to preach in this. <laughs> Any ideas on that? <laughs> well, so I've got a work called The Unknown Bible, and one of the chapters in that is on the fundamentalist who went to hell. <laughs> and the fundamentalist who went to hell is Balaam. I come number numbers chapter twenty three. Now of course that's tongue in cheek. I mean uh, you're you're saved by grace through faith, and the difference between you and Balaam is real simple. Here in the Old Testament, it's impossible the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. Now if even Balaam was in a grace situation; his sins weren't taken away. Abraham's weren't. Neither was Isaac, neither was Jacob. Yeah, Hebrews chapter 10 says it is impossible the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. But something else is wrong. Balaam is not in the body of Christ. Balaam is not spiritually circumcised. Balaam is not born again. So he's in a situation where if he messes up, the Holy Spirit who speaks through him can leave him like he did Saul and some others. And then he's in trouble. All right, now, what, everything he said about Balaam is true. Come to Numbers chapter 24. And he's a man who speaks by the Spirit of God. And he lifted his eyes, and he saw Israel abiding in their tents, according to their tribes. And the Spirit of God came upon him. Verse 3, the man whose eyes are open. He has said which heard the words of God, which saw the vision of the Almighty, so forth and so on. So he's speaking by the Holy Spirit with direct revelation from God. 16. He has said which heard the words of God, and knew the knowledge of the Most High, which saw the vision, and he prophesies of Christ. But then a little bit later, in the book of Numbers, uh, he winds up killed. And it's the Jews that kill him. Come to Numbers 31. 
And just a little footnote here, you may not notice in Numbers 31, 8. When they go out to fight against the Midianites, they run into Balaam. Numbers 31, 8. And they slew the kings of Midian, beside the rest of them that were slain, namely Eva and Rechem and Zur and Hur and Reba, five kings of Midian. P.S. Balaam also the son of Beor they slew with the sword. Now the first time he ran the name of the Lord, he had a donkey to help him out or, and kept him getting killed. That time his donkey wasn't there to help him and he got killed. And Second Peter 2 and Jude say he lost. Uh, Picture the false prophet to whom the mist of outer darkness is reserved forever and the darkness, outer darkness uh, is reserved forever. Um, 2 Peter 2 verse 15, which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, found the way of Balaam, the son of Bosar, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. These are wells without order, clouds carried about with a tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. So Balaam's a real unusual character. He's a character that God uses and the Spirit of God speaks through him, but he's not saved. And it means what it means from your standpoint is like Caiaphas in John chapter 12, being a high priest that year, he prophesied that Christ would not only die for the nation, but for the children of God scattered abroad. It means that an unsaved preacher can preach the truth and the Spirit can speak through him. That's what that thing means. Now, Balaam has three things about him here. The first one you want to see is this. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 15, the way of Balaam. That's called the way of Balaam. Now, there's another thing it's, uh, uh, it's called here, and this is the book of Jude. And the book of Jude, he has another name for it. Uh, Jude, uh, uh, verse 11. Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily, greedily after the error of Balaam. But right, there's the way of Balaam, there's the error of Balaam. Now there's one more thing. There's the doctrine of Balaam. And for that come to Revelation. And Revelation pick up uh, oh, Revelation chapter 2. Uh, Revelation chapter 2 verse 14. The way of Balaam and the uh, error of Balaam and the doctrine of Balaam. Revelation chapter 2 verse 14. But I have a few things against thee, because thou wast there then to hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block. Now you don't know what happened back in Numbers, it isn't recorded. But when you get to Revelation, you know what happened back in Numbers. Because in, in Revelation he says the doctrine of Balaam was to teach this king, Balak, how to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. When he mentions the passage, he mentions the fact that they're uh, teaching uh, fornication as part of the worship service. Idols and fornication. All right, now go back to Numbers chapter 25, and now you know what happened that isn't recorded in Numbers 25. What happened was Balaam never did get right. He never did get right. He was only right as long as God threatened to kill him. And as soon as God quit threatened to kill him, he went right back to the old ways. And it's a remarkable thing, because when the, when the Lord first appeared that fellow at night, uh, Balaam said to his, to his uh, people who came to him, he said, he said, um, tarry here, and I'll, I'll see what the Lord will say. And he goes upstairs, and that night the Lord appears to him in a vision, and he says, number one, thou shalt not go with the men. Two, thou shalt not curse the people. Three, they're blessed. He gives them a three-point message. When that bird comes down the next morning, the people say, what did the Lord say? And he says, the Lord refused to give me permission to go with you. Left out two points. And that's the same bird that later, the later says, as the Lord liveth, what the Lord telleth me, that shall I speak. And I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord to add. That's the pious fellow that says that. But the first time God came to me, gave him three-point message, he knocked out two points. And the reason why the angel of the Lord met that bird in the way and almost killed him is not because he was in the permissive will of God, like the Schofield notes say. Schofield knows what he's talking about. There's no permissive will of God to it. The fact is he disobeyed the Lord completely. Because the second time those fellows came to him, the Lord said to him at night, If the men come to call thee, go with them. But the word that I say, thou shalt thou speak. And the next verse said he rose up early in the morning and went with them. They didn't call him. That was the first disobedience. And he didn't promise he'd say what God told him to say. That's the second one. That's why they and the Lord met him to kill him. All right, then when the Lord threatened to kill him, the Lord said, okay, now you go, but the word I'm going to say, you're going to speak. And when that fellow gets up and preaches under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he's preaching under force. 
He's forced to do it under pain of death. And when that thing is over, look what he does. 25.1 And Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom of the daughters of Moab. And they called the people of the sacrifice their gods, and the people that eat and bowed down to their gods. And Israel joined himself to Baal Peor, and the anger of the Lord was killed against Israel, and there they get a bunch of them get killed. Now who is this? Six Midianites. See them six Midianites? That's the bunch that they killed in Numbers 31. Numbers 31, when you read about the Midianites getting killed, the kings of Midian, they got Balaam with them. He was with them. You hear what this means? I mean, that bird got through talking up there in the mountain and prophesying all this wonderful stuff about uh, the lawgiver shall not depart from Judah, nor a, a lawgiver between his feet till Shiloh come to him, the gathering of the people be and all that stuff, and a scepter shall rise out of Judah and smite the corners of Moab and all that kind of stuff about the coming of Christ. Under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that stuff was over. And he went off, and Balaam said, The Lord has kept you from getting a reward. And Balaam said, Didn't I tell you I could only tell you what the Lord told me to say? And then here's what took place that isn't in the account. He goes off away, and then Balaam said, Now, I'll tell you what, is that reward still good? And Balak says, Well, you can't get it because you didn't curse them. And Balaam said, I'll show you how to fix those people so God will curse them if you give me the money. And Balak says, Okay, you name your price. He said, Okay, mega bucks, man. Here's how you do it. What you do is you get their, your daughters to marry their sons, and you get their sons to marry their daughters, and God will kill them the doctrine of Balaam in Revelation chapter he integrate them Revelation 2 when that bunch get together the anger of the Lord is kindled against them and boy they go 22,000 in a day so Balaam is a picture of a fellow who's speaking the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and he's lost it could happen now it could yes well you couldn't apply it to the body of Christ for man the body of Christ he's saved and he's not just speaking on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit's in him and he's joined to the Lord turn to 1 Corinthians and he's part of the Lord and he couldn't lose it like Balaam lost it uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 Corinthians chapter uh, oh, uh, 6 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 17 a man in the body of Christ is something else of course Balaam's not in the body of Christ uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17, He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. The man in the body of Christ, the Holy Spirit's in him, he's in the Holy Spirit, and he's part of Jesus Christ. It'd have to be a fellow outside the body of Christ, but the Holy Spirit could speak through him. Yes? So it wouldn't speak, it wouldn't speak to a pastor today that are preaching from a pulpit that aren't saved. It could if they weren't saved. That's true. Yes, sir. That's true. Yes, sir. Yeah, a liberal, a modernistic preacher can... Uh, Preach the truth. A busted clock can be right two times a day. <laughs> okay, something else. I have a hypothetical question. All right. Uh, in Matthew 11, it says, uh, if you believe, uh, Romans 14, John says, that Christ says, uh, if you believe, then we have to put in Elijah, if you have received. Now, if they would have received, he would have been Elijah. Yes. My hypothetical question is, would Paul then the Antichrist and say he breathed out threatening daily against the church? <laughs> no, he can't make that. I'll tell you why. Come to John chapter 17. Although it's a, it's a thought, I'll tell you what he could have been. He could have been the false prophet announcing the Antichrist. John 17. Now here's the problem. The problem is the Antichrist identified before Christ dies on the cross. John 17, 12. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those thou gavest me I have kept, none of them is lost. But the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And of course the reference is to Judas. Come to John chapter, John chapter 6. Uh, Paul is utterly human. But Judas Iscariot was something else. John 6, verse 70. John 6, verse 70. Jesus answered, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spake of Judas Iscariot. Now, the way that format would could have worked, as far as Paul goes, and Paul wasn't converted at this time. He's raised and came with him. The way that thing could have worked, if Christ dies and 
buried and comes up 40 days and 40 nights, goes back, and then Acts chapter 7, that's the crucial place. In Acts chapter 7, Stephen says, I see the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God, which wasn't true in Acts 2. Peter says he's seated at the right hand of God. And it's not true in Hebrews chapter 3 and 10, he's seated at the right hand. He's sitting down here and sitting down here, but he's getting up here. So he's getting up there to do something. And I'm much doubt about what he's getting up to do. He's getting up to come and catch out the body. There's going to be a rapture right there. If there's acceptance. And the question he asked was, if there had been acceptance, the body caught out there, then what about Paul? Because old Paul here in Acts 7, 8, 9 is killing Christians. And if a body had been caught out there, Daniel's 70th week would have started right there. And John the Baptist would have been Elijah, like he said. But in the case you had like that right there, what would happen right there and that thing right there was the, uh, the Roman emperor would at that time sign a covenant with the Jews and keep that covenant for three and a half years. And the last three and a half years he'd go from Rome as the man of sin and move to Jerusalem as the son of perdition. And at that time, Judas Iscariot would come up from the bottomless pit and enter that bird, and that bird would become the devil incarnate. And that'd be the Antichrist. That wouldn't be Paul. But Paul could have been the false prophet. He could have heralded him. All right, something else. Yeah. Come chaos? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. That's that's uh, Genesis three. What he's talking about? Uh, Genesis three, and uh, compare that on the condition of the land. There, compare Genesis three with Amos nine, and that law of entropy works everywhere. I think is the evolution is not a law. Evolution is what you call a horse laugh. The word evolve means to unroll. If you want to know what it means, and the more a thing unrolls, the less it gets. <laughs> So the word evolution is a hee-haw, it's a joke. I got a book at home by a fellow who, who is, he's a oh, young fellow, he's a PhD, he thinks he's real smart, and he got a book to prove, to prove that men will turn into computers and they'll get immortality by being an immortal computer machine. And uh, of course I, I guessed all that, I mean eight years ago I wrote a book called Science and Philosophy and then I've got the end of that thing, I've got uh, 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 Rudolph the Red-Nosed Robot. And uh, and machine the measure of all things. What man is going to do? He's going to invent a machine that's smarter than he is, and then worship it, and trust it to guide him and show him what to do. You see, it's an image of a beast. <laughs> all right, now this entropy, entropy. What he's talking about entropy is this: the second law of thermodynamics teaches this. It teaches there's always less energy to work with than there was before, and there's always a dissipation or disintegration of energy so that you never have as much left as you had before to work with. Now it's still there. It's resident, but it's ineffective. It's like water going over a waterfall. As you can't create destroy matter, that's the first law of thermodynamics, so you don't do away with the energy. But it's placed in a place where you can't use it. And that entropy means a dissipation of energy that's continuous until finally everything comes to a low, flat, dull, colorless mush. And that's the law of reality. That's reality. And that's all through the Bible. The thing he's talking about on the ground is the same type of thing. What we're going to look at here is a, is a disintegration of the earth until the Lord comes outside the closed system and comes in and injects new energy into the system. Now this thing is so is so you talk about you talk about a book being heavy man and truthful. There's nothing like a Bible. There's nothing like a Bible. And you think I'll stop uh, I'll get in this thing in a minute, but you think you think a fellow who had a used car would understand this principle. <laughs> I mean how a man could think believe in evolution with a used car is impossible to imagine. <laughs> now you take you take our bodies, let's let's just face it. How's the best way to, to stay in good health? Don't eat. 
I mean, carbohydrates will kill you if you get too much of them. Protein is bad for you, and the roughage will kill you if that's all you get. And if you get the right balance, you'll fall apart anyway. I mean, the best way to live forever is just quit eating and starve to death. <laughs> you see, you see this body? When I'm born, there's an, in, there's an influx of energy. That's the creation. From that time till now, I die. You say, well, you develop. Yeah, but you don't evolve. And when you're developing, you've got to keep putting the stuff in your mouth. You think a fellow could get that? Uh, the way you stay alive is you keep putting the stuff in here. See? And it, and it goes turns into energy. And as you get older and older, it gets slower and slower to turn into energy. And you have to do more and more exercise to burn it up and eat less and less, keep putting on the pounds. It's a law. It's, it's What it means is that evolution is a joke. A man that believes in evolution is mentally sick. He hasn't got a mirror. <laughs> you can look in a mirror and see the old gray mare ain't what she used to be, see. I mean, I can still play a little hockey, you know, and soccer and racquetball and run two or three miles. But let's just face it, man. When I get in a hospital and go up six flights of stairs, 15 stairs at a time, I know things aren't exactly like they used to be. And it's growing late toward evening. <laughs> and like I say, I mean, makeup may take a good bit off a woman this age, you know, but you can't fool a flight of stairs. <laughs> and the thing is, the way you keep the body going is you keep putting the stuff in from the outside. That means in a closed system, there's absolute disintegration no matter what you do. So the evolutionist is crazy. He's insane. He's telling you that this thing has always been here, and it's, it's a closed system. There's no God. Now, it's a theistic evolution. He puts a little doojig in it, but it won't line up the scripture. God said here there wasn't any rain until there was a man on the earth. Do you know evolutionists who believe there wasn't any rain before the man showed up? Why, a theistic evolutionist doesn't believe that. So you've got this closed system here with just... Yes, what's here, the material is just here. There's no outside force to inject energy into the system. What will happen? The system will collapse. Now, of course, they got, I know all the answers, boy, have I heard of man. Uh, well, it goes into a black hole, and then it blows up again and makes a new universe, and then contracts and expands. It's like kind of an accordion, see? <laughs> I don't care how many times it collapsed and exploded, eventually the cotton-picking thing would wear out. You say, why entropy? The law of energy. The second bang wouldn't be as big as the first bang, and the fifth bang wouldn't be as big as the second bang, and the twentieth bang wouldn't be as bangy as the tenth bang, and after 20,000 bangs, it'd just bang out. <laughs> That's the law. Now, you understand that? You understand if you're human, you quit feeding your face, you drop dead. All right, Genesis chapter 3. Now, here's the curse put on nature, on the ground. Uh, Genesis chapter 3. Uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 17. Because thou hast hearkened the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten the tree which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thee of it all thy days for thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall bring it forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field, and the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return to the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, dust thou shalt return. You know how that applies to? That applies to any saved or unsaved person anywhere in the world for 4,000 years. 6,000 years. A dispensationalist would put that in the dispensation. That ain't no dispensation. That thing covers every man, woman, child in this building. He came out of dirt, you go back to dirt. That's, that's, the law, that's the law. That dispensation runs clear through. Now that thing there is the beginning of entropy. That thing is there. The Lord puts something wrong on the ground. From that time on, the ground begins to go down. Now there's some ways you know that. One way is the book of Exodus, uh, Exodus chapter 25. He said you to sow that land every six years and every seventh year to let that land rest. Why? It's getting wore out. It's getting wore out. You let it rest the seventh year and go the eighth year. Now, you take America, you couldn't do that anymore because the thing is geared up to where the farmer, he ain't even making a living, you know, sowing every year. The banks own the stuff. Back in World War II, we got our factories open day and night running 24-hour shift. They never quit after World War II. They should have quit. They didn't. 
the emergency uh, emergency laws that FDR put through back in 45, 49, you still got them, even if you don't have a war. And that, that constant work, 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 just wears the stuff out. Now you think anybody could get that, but nobody gets it. So now after all this stuff, with all keeping the factories all, all this time, all this stuff to the ground, now you've got a bunch of communists called environmentalists that run around and they want to control this thing and try to save dear old Mother Earth and save the dear old globe. You can't save dear old Mother Earth. She's a shambles, man. She's, you know, God go to dear old Mother, uh, Mother Earth. He's going to burn her. He's going to burn her. Second Peter chapter 3. But with that... Do you ever stop and think about what a mess is going to be in the tribulation when these environmentalists see the whole world just burning, tore up, locusts eating it, demons running around, mountains blowing up, rivers turning to blood, driving archaeologists up the wall, you know. And what's happening is the ground wears out. Now, you know why you die? Because everything you eat, you get from the ground. And there's something wrong with the ground. And as time goes by, it goes more, the law of entropy. It loses the minerals. It loses the vitamins. Ask any farmer. You plant the stuff and there's no rain. You get baked clay and the seed doesn't make. The next time you get plenty of rain, washes the thing out. <clears throat> next time you get just enough right rain, the bugs get it. Then you spray it and the bugs get used to the spray. Then you spray more spray to get cancer of meat and stuff. You can't fix it. The horrible law, brother, I hate to break this news to you, but you're of age now, you ought to be able to face the truth. <laughs> The horrible law of life is everything falls to pieces. That's the law of life. But folks don't want to hear that. They want to hear in every day, in every way, things are getting better and better. So these politicians get up, if you vote me in, we'll take care of this, we'll take care of this, we'll bring this in, we'll bring... You ain't going to bring nothing in, it's going to fall apart. The answer is not integration or segregation, it's disintegration. The Germans say, in case of war, the, rain, the case of rain, the war will be held in the auditorium, which means it's going to get worse. But you can't get people to vote for you with that. Suppose I ran the Republican ticket this year. Vote for Ruckman, 1992. Vote for Ruckman. What do I promise? I promise chaos, disintegration, catastrophe. Well, who'd vote for you? People want a dream, you see. All right, Amos chapter 9. <clears throat> Bob Jones Sr. says, prepare for the worst and hope for the best. Amos chapter 9. I know how to fix it. Vote for me. I'll tell you how to fix it. Get Jesus Christ to come back. He'll fix it. You know what happens when he comes back? There's a new influx of energy. And then it starts back over again. You know what happens then? It runs down. <laughs> the thing is incurable. Do you ever, do you ever read the Bible? Not, I didn't mean to get preaching, but it gets holy after a while. They start at the top, you see. They start in a perfect condition. Now, come on, boys. What could be more perfect than married uh, to a Miss Universe and have no competitors? And you ladies married to Rambo the Third or whatever, no competitors. And both of you naked and sleeping outdoors at night in a jungle of roses. And the temperature never above 75 degrees. And no wasps and no insects. And no work to do and no taxes. And no dishes to wash. And painless childbirth. And all the animals your friends. And fellowship with God. Can you improve on that? Why, you couldn't if you tried. When they start, they start as high as you can start. And what happens? <laughs> down they go. And they go down. What does God do? He pulls them out and starts them again. What happens? <laughs> down they go. Flood. God reaches in and pulls them out with Noah, starts them again. What happens? He gets drunk. <laughs> God calls out Abraham or the Chaldees. Fine, Abraham. His seed goes down to Egypt. Slave laborers, 400 years. He calls them out of Egypt, men of the promised land. They worship idols. I'm telling you, it's down. He gives them David for a king. They go on a posse to Nebuchadnezzar, cast them off to captivity. He sends them his son. Here we go now. <laughs> they crucify him. You know what you call that? You call out the law of human collapse. You know what it means to you as a child of God? It means that if you don't spend time in that book and get an influx of energy from an outside source, you will fall apart. That's what that means. It means that when you got saved, see, right at the top, you know what happens to you as soon as you begin to say, as soon as you get saved, you know what begins to happen to you? You begin to fall apart. Your new birth marks your destruction. 
You say, why? That's the high point. You're going to hell, see? Lord pulls you out. Now where do you go? Straight down like a bullet. You've got to have an influx of an outside source of entropy kills you. Well, I said one time, he said, well, what if you took a bunch of sardines and put them in a can and vacuum packed them and put them in a vacuum aluminum something or other, a uh, platinum something or other, a constant temperature, would they keep forever? No, they wouldn't keep forever. In 20,000 years, the platinum would rot. In 40,000 years, the can would rot. They stink to high heaven, man. You say, what? Well, entropy, entropy. You'd have to have something come to the outside to inject something in there. You know what happens in the millennium? Jesus Christ comes back. Here's the tribulation. People right in the bottom millennium. Christ on earth. Glory. Hallelujah. You know what happens? Straight down. In the millennium, revolt. Devil goes up about the beloved city and fire comes down from heaven to destroy. Do you know when you're safe? You're safe after the millennium when God sent down fire and burned the whole thing up and eternity starts. Now you're safe if you're saved. <laughs> you know why you are? Because you're in a system where there's no dissipation of energy. You're with God. And God's always been there. So he can't lose energy. The thing is physics. I mean, the God that made the universe made it so it'd fall apart gradually, but he ain't going to... Let me show this. Hebrews chapter. Let me show this to you. Hebrews chapter 1. I know what I'm saying. I just don't look like it. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1, 10. There's no entropy in God. I am that I am. There's no tense. There's no I was, I am, and I'm going to be. He's all there one time. Hebrews 1, 10. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heaven is the work of thine hands. They shall perish. The universe is destructible. But thou remainest. They shall wax old, there's your entropy, like a garment. And as a vesture shalt thou fold them, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. If you just get where God is, you get it, you get it fixed. Just get where God is. It is like getting plugged in a 220 volt circuit and just stand on a high forever. <laughs> I can't imagine what that's going to be like. But that's what that's that's what that's where to go. That's what to get. All right, one more, Amos 9. Now, the question had to do with the ground. We've discussed it enough now. You can see what's happened to the ground. The ground is pooping out, and it's going to get worse. Now, the Lord comes back, and what happens when he comes back? There's a new infusion of energy into the ground, into the dirt. Amos 9.13. Amos 9.13. Behold, the day is come, saith the Lord. The plowman shall overtake the reaper. The crops are coming right after each other. And the guy is, the guy is reaping, and right behind the guy is coming along to plow the next crop. And overtake the reaper, the treader of grapes, him it sow a seed. And the mountain shall drop sweet wine, all the hills shall melt. I will bring again the captive of my people of Israel, and they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof, and they shall make gardens and eat the fruit of them. And I will plant them upon their land, and they shall no more be pulled up by thy land which I have given them, saith the Lord God. Now, one of the reasons for this is going to be the brightness of the sun. Come to Isaiah. And in Isaiah, I notice what the Lord says about the sun in the day when he comes back. Uh, I haven't got this mark. Maybe two will find a time to find it. If some of you find it before I do, I want the light of the sun should be the light of seven days and the light of the moon seven times in the day the Lord bindeth up the stroke of his people. Anybody got it? I don't have a marked Bible here. I, 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 I steal these out of the motel when I have a meeting. It's, it's a Gideon Bible out of the motel I'm using. It doesn't have any marks in it. But if I had more marked Bible, I could find it in a minute. All right. 30, what is it, bro? All right. 3026. Yeah, that's it. 26. Moreover, the light of the moon shall be the light of the sun, and the light of the sun shall be sevenfold, as the light of seven days, in the day the Lord bindeth up the breach of his people. Look at that influx of energy. Seven times what you've got right now. All the energy in this life comes on this earth, physically comes from the sun. It'll be seven times what you've got right now. More energy coming in. 
so there's something coming in there to stop the entropy. But after a thousand years, away we go again. <laughs> I told you last night, see, the answer is God. The answer is God. The rest of the stuff is temporary. It's temporary. Okay, something else. I mean, getting that long thing there, but he gets run off with you. Gets walking off with you after a while. Anybody, go ahead. Yes, sir. Noah's commission was the same as Adam's to replenish the earth, but Adam's commission was replenish also. This is another hypothetical question. What was before Adam? Now, for that, come back to Genesis. Notice these two words are the same in the King James Bible. And by the way, they're not the same in any other Bible. Uh, Genesis chapter uh, Genesis chapter 1 on one hand, and Genesis chapter 9 on the other. Uh, these days, the hobby horse at Bob Jones University is what they call King James onlyism. That's a little cliche invented by Bob Jones the third. He has two things. He has Ruckmanism and King James onlyism. Those are supposed to be heresies. So you put the ism on them. You're like Mormonism, you know, and, and that kind of thing. And so the idea is if you believe the Bible, you're a Ruckmanite. That makes you a cult. And if you're a King James onlyism, then you're this horrible cultic heresy that accepts only the King James Bible. And that's the talk of a fool. If you see him, tell him I said so, and he knows where I live. And he can come down any time. We'll pay his way down and back. And uh, King James onlyism means that you go by the King James Bible and don't accept the other Bibles. Now, folks, I'm going to tell you something. If you use a King James only Bible, you have access to truth that you cannot find in any other Bible. That is no. You have access to truth that you can't find in any other Bibles. For example, if you have a King James Bible that says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, and that isn't in any other Bible. There's no Bible in the market that says study to show yourself proven to God. There isn't any. Except King James. Now if you're King James only, as you may got the truth, if you're anything else, you got a lie. I call that dead duck otherism. That's my name for it. <laughs> they teach you heresy called dead duck otherism. <laughs> now here's a case here. If you picked up any Bible but a King James Bible, here's what you'd read. Genesis 1, 20, uh, 1 28. But God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth. Not replenish. Replenish implies redoing something, something that's been done before. So when they remove that, they remove the key to the question he asked about from the Bible. Genesis 9.1, If you had any other Bible but a King James, you'd read this. And God blessed Noah and his son, and said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. But your King James says, Replenish which means to redo something, plenish, plenitude, was filled up, and you redo it. It was filled up one time, you fill it up again. Now that's a key to something in the Bible you can find only in this Bible. And if you have any other Bible, you can't find it. There are a lot of things like that. For example, last night that message I quoted you a verse, which you may or may have not known was in any Bible. It's called, he said, the love of money is root of all evil. That isn't in the Bible, unless you've got a King James Bible. There are no Bibles that say the love of money is root of all evil, except this one. So if you're King James only, isn't it? you have a truth, and if you're not, you've got a lie. I'll tell you another one. This book here says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21, it says, abstain from all appearance of evil. There are no Bibles that say that, except the King James. A whole bunch of them. I give you ten dozen of them just like that. If you're going to go just by King James, you've got access to information that nobody else has access to, but has access to 50 other translations. If you, you say, how do you know? I've got them down at the, at the school. I teach my kids Berkeley, Moffat, Weymouth, Goodspeed, Centennial, Phillips, Weist, RSV, New RSV, ASV, New ASV, RV, CEV. I teach my kid 26 translations. We know what's in them. Strange, strange age we live in. You pick up an article in the Soul of the Lord. Here's a full page ad in the Soul of the Lord. It says, Come to Hiles Anderson. We use nothing but the King James Bible in our classrooms. You never saw an ad like that in the bulletin. Isn't that strange? 
And they'll go to Bob Jones and get in the pulpit to preach, and this little sign down there hidden where the congregation can't see it. <laughs> I mean, providing things honest in the sight of all men, you know. And the thing sitting out like that that says, please use nothing from this pulpit but a King James Version. Why do that? I haven't got a sign in my pulpit saying that. Mother Bart, you got a sign in your pulpit saying that? Why, why, why do you have to have a sign like that? You sure the guy might get prepared to use an ASV? That's okay with me. I don't care. But if I got a, if I got a guy in my pulpit and he got up there and used a new ASV, I'd let him use it. Wouldn't bother me any. I wouldn't get up interrupted. I'd just sit there and have me a ball, man. <laughs> I mean, the guy got preaching. You know what happened in my church? <laughs> About 300 of my people start going. <laughs> <laughs> I fellow know he's in the wrong pew real quick. Now, if you have a King James Bible, King James only, you've got something replenished. All right, I'm going to give you two passages, and then I'm going to draw it out for you if I can and try to make it clear. Get Psalm 82 and get Job 30, 38. Psalm 82 and Job 38. like a King James Bible clear up a seminary. All right, uh, Job 38 and Psalm 82. All right, first of all, I'm in Job chapter 38, beginning at verse 4. Job 38, beginning at verse 4. Now, he's asking Job some questions, and he says this. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? That's Genesis 1.1. Declare if thou hast understanding, who hath laid the measure thereof that thou knowest, who hath stretched the line upon it, whereupon are the foundations fastened, or who laid the cornerstone thereof. Now watch it. When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. There are sons of God there in Genesis 1-1. All right, Psalm 82. Psalm 82, verse 1. Psalm 82, 1, God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods. Verse 5, they know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. Something went wrong with the earth. I have said to your gods, said that to somebody, and all of you are the children of the Most High, but you shall die like men. As a contrast. He said, somebody, you're gods, but you're not going to die like gods, you're going to die like men. Now, you don't say, I have said you're cats, but you shall die like cats. You've got to get something that's, uh, that's disjunctive. You've got to get a thing like, I have said you're cats, but you die like fleas. Or I have said you're horses, but you die like dogs. They're not the same kind. Now, you said, I have said you're gods, but you're going to die like men. So those things are two different things. Now... The surest way you know that that replenish there in, in, in Genesis chapter 1 is a reference to a population of some kind before Adam is this. And this is a strange thing. But what you do is study Adam as a type of Noah. And you study that because the same thing was said to both men. The same thing was said, be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. Now these similitudes between these two are remarkable. They're remarkable. For example, uh, both of them are given the whole earth as a domain. Both of them are set up to give dominion over it. They're both set up as kings. They both have three sons. One of their sons is under a curse. One of their sons is under a blessing. They're both naked when they sin, and they both put something into their mouth when they sin. That's a remarkable thing, you see. The match meets. That one there has three sons, uh, Adam, uh, uh, Cain, Seth, and Abel. Three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. One are a curse. Uh, the curse from Cain, the mark. Curse of be Cain, and a servant of servant should be to his brethren. One of his boys, Adam, his boys, a type of Christ, Abel. Blessed be the Lord God of Shem. That's the blessing. Or right, they're both naked when they sin. They both put something in their mouth when they sin. They're identical. Those two birds are identical. No one Adam. All right, the Lord said, Adam, you replenish something. And we know there was something there before Noah got out of the ark. There was a whole civilization there. So here's what we have. We got Noah in this ark, floating here on top of this water. 
And when he gets out of the ark here, the Lord said, replenish it because there was something here before that flood. All right, Adam's over here. Adam's sitting over here at this side of the flood. And Noah's sitting over here at this side. And the Lord tells Adam to replenish something. And there had to be a flood over here. And something here before there. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 3. And there's that flood. And that flood is not Noah's flood. 2 Peter chapter 3, begin about verse oh, 2 or 3 there. Know this in the last day, a scarfish shall come. Saying, where is the promise of his coming? What verse is that? 3 and 4. Right, 2 Peter chapter 3, 3 and 4. Know this also in the last days, perilous times, uh, scoffers shall come, walking after their own lust, saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For this they willing you know, uh, of uh, all things that he of the word from the, from the uh, beginning of the creation. For this the willing eager know that the heavens were of old, the earth standing in the water, and out of the water, the earth that then was being overflowed with water perished. That is no reference to know at all. The context was the beginning of the creation. It's Genesis 1. Now go back to Genesis 1. This time you look at Genesis 1. Look at that water showing up in there that all of them missed. Genesis 1, Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Verse 2, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness upon the face of the deep. Look out, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the what? They're there. There's two floods. All right, this flood here is in Genesis chapter, Genesis chapter 6, 7, 8. And that flood over there is in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. And that means as there was a population here, there had to be a population there. Now, it can't be a population of uh, people. It can't be a population of men. Uh, I'll show you why. I come to, uh, come to uh, Romans chapter 5. If it's a population of men, then you've got sin around before Adam. And sin isn't around before Adam among people. Now, you read about the devil in Ezekiel chapter 28, the anointed cherub that covereth, and thou was perfect in thy ways, thou was created until iniquity was found in thee. So you got sin around in regard to the devil, but not in regards to man. All right, Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 5, verse uh, 12. Wherefore is by one man sin and entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men for all of sin. Who is it? Verse 14 is Adam. It's Adam. That means the pre-Adamic race, and there was a race, was not human beings. They weren't a race of men. They were a race of called the sons of God. They were angels. And the devil was over them. And they got bombed out there in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. Okay. That race chapter 1. Yeah. Uh, is that, is that Yes, sir. Now they call it they call it a gap theory in the uh, in the textbooks, and there's no theory to it. It's an absolute fact. There's any question about it? Yes, sir. And my problem is the book of Revelation. Yeah. Revelation, Lord. Well, how will that fit in with this here? Well, he made a 66% error, 2 Peter 3. He left out the other two, 2 Peter 3. He missed two of them. There are three of them. 2 Peter chapter two, 3. I've got a little remedial problem there and counting on his fingers. 2 Peter chapter 3. Our 2 Peter chapter 3, verse uh, 5. For this they willing to be ignorant of, the word of God, the heavens were of old, the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was. All right. That's back there. Verse 7. But the heavens and earth which are now. There's the second one. 
the same word are kept in store. Uh, verse 13, Nevertheless, we, according to this promise, look for a new heavens and earth. There's Revelation 21. There are three of them. There's the heaven and earth that were there in Genesis 1. There's the heaven and earth that have been there since Genesis 1, verse 3. And the heaven and earth will show up in Revelation 21. Your professor is 66% wrong. And what he's doing teaching, I have no idea. But that's how the snow blows, boys and girls. <laughs> the bigger the belfry, the more room for the bats. You know what the problem is? The problem is that book. Now, everything I've given you right now is in that book, and it's in there in sixth grade English. There's something about higher education that picks the fellow where he can't read. <laughs> That's what Pember says. Pember, Pember uh, says that's the spirits of those things are your modern demons. I don't buy that. Uh, I don't believe that's right. He might be right. I don't buy that. I'll show you why. Come to Matthew chapter <clears throat> Matthew chapter 12. And get Matthew chapter 12 in one hand. And get... Uh, no. Please ask his chapter 10, the other. Please ask his 10, then with your third hand, uh, pick up uh, Mark chapter. Mark chapter 3. No, I better make it 4. Mark 4 and Matthew 12. And Ecclesiastes 10. Now the problem here comes up <clears throat> about the origination of demons. There are several things they can't be, and Pember connects them with the fallen angels. I don't connect them with fallen angels because every angel, as far as I can tell in the Bible, is a 33-year-old male. That's why they're called sons. And uh, they don't have any wings. And these demons are something else. All right, Mark chapter 4, Mark chapter 4, verse 3. Mark 4, 3, Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow. And it came to pass as he sowed, some fell by the wayside. Now watch it. And the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. Birds. Interpretation. Verse 15. These are they by the wayside where the word is sown, but when they have heard, Satan comes. What Satan? His birds Fouls. I've right, taken a, a, a corollary with this in Matthew. Come back to Matthew. We're already in chapter 12. And look in 13. And in 13, look how it's worded here. 13, verse 4. Matthew 13, 4. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Interpretation. Verse 19. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and understands it not, then cometh the wicked one. Birds. Unclean spirits that come from Satan, the unclean spirit, are called birds. You know what happened when Jesus Christ was baptized? The Holy Spirit descended in the form of a what? You see that thing? I mean... Custer at Bob Jones University wrote a book on the truth about the King James controversy, and he had a chapter there called Ruckman's Peculiar Teachings. And one of Ruckman's peculiar teaching was that demons have wings. Well, there was something peculiar about Custer's mentality to make him deny the Word of God from cover to cover. It's all through there. For example, Matthew chapter 12. He has a very peculiar mentality for a Christian. Matthew chapter 12, Matthew chapter 12, verse 24. And when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of devils. You know what Beelzebub is? That's the Lord of the flies, the God of filth, flies. They say he's got a bee in the bonnet. Don't you know what they say? Bird brain. Don't they say? Bats in the belfry. See that stuff? Now you take that fly, that thing hangs out with filth. What does that mosquito do? It 
it sucks blood. You know how many demons the maniac of Gadara had in him? A thousand. They couldn't be angels. They'd have to be as small as mosquitoes. The things are winged. Ecclesiastes chapter 10. This one of the Bible's peculiar teachings that a PhD at Bob Jones can't understand because he's stupid. <laughs> Please ask his chapter 10, verse 20. Curse not the king, nor not my thought, and curse not the rich in thy bedchamber. For a bird of the air shall carry the voice. How can that be? And that which hath wings shall tell of the matter. There's something in your bedroom. Your room is bugged. <laughs> you see those expressions come from? The bird man of Alcatraz. You see that Jonathan Seagull? See all that stuff? But I said he's a bird watcher. See that stuff? What the Germans say, they say, Herr Hanhein Vogel, he's got a bird. That's what they say. On Revelation chapter 18, it doesn't stop and it's all through here. Custer is just stupid. It's his lack of education. Revelation chapter 18. You need to get this book I wrote called The Anti Intellectual Manifesto. Now you get a blessing out of that. That's a book to prove that every fellow that ever won after education in a big way did it to make a living. And that all the great textbooks written by all the great men are just written to sell to help tradesmen carry on the living. And uh, I call it tradesmen with bloody hands. You know what John Rice used to say? He used to say a man that is not winning the souls of Christ is guilty of the folly of a short-sighted fool because even a soul wise he's guilty of following Christ afar off because Christ said follow me and I'll make you to become fishers of men and he has bloody hands because Christ the Ezekiel said his blood will require your hand so when John Rice was in his right mind when he was preaching evangelistically he said that a Christian who isn't winning souls to Christ is following Christ afar off has bloody hands and is a short sighted fool and then when he lost his mind and wrote a book called Our God Breathed Bible, he bragged about people like Robert Dick Wilson and B.B. Warfield and J. Gresham Machen, and they never led a soul to Christ in their life. They were five-point Calvinists who believed in absolute predestination. Every one of them was a fool with bloody hands following Christ afar off, according to John R. Rice. Something, boy, I'll tell you. Something. This educated stuff. Uh, I'll get this. Well, I'll read this first and then get in that. Revelation 18. Revelation 18, verse 2. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the greatest fallen is fallen, has become the habitation of devils, the hold of every foul spirit, and the cage of every clean and hateful what? That's right there. It's there every time you look. Now, you know, when, when I got my Ph.D. at Bob Jones, I went through a situation there, which you might have guessed. <laughs> I mean, when I went up to Bob Jones, I wasn't a bright little, neat, uh, sweet, clean-cut young man, 18 or 19 or 20. I was like an old bull moose coming off the ranges, man. I was 27 years old, and I'd had years in dance bands and bar rooms and beaches and brawls and D.I. in the infantry and God knows what. And I came in there. They didn't know what they had a hold of. They had a hold of bad news, man. And I came there and sat down, and I didn't swallow all that stuff. But I came in there, and the time came to get my doctor's uh, dissertation. You know what I wrote on? I wrote a book on practical theology in the light of the book of Acts. That was my dissertation. You know what that dissertation, the thesis of that thing was? The thesis of that thing was, if a man is not trying to win people to Christ, if he's not making an effort to do it, he's a heretic. That was the thesis. The thesis was, I don't care how much orthodoxy the man professes, if he's not actively engaged in trying to win people to Christ, he's heterodox. He's a heretic. You can imagine how that went over with the faculty and the staff at Bob Jones. Bless my soul. None of which led a soul to Christ in 50 years. I was in a preacher's boys class of 1,200 students under Gilbert Stenholm. And Stenholm, teaching 1,200 young preachers, had never been an evangelist or a pastor or a missionary or a rescue superintendent. What could he teach us? Bless your soul, honey. I've set up three independent Baptist churches from nothing. You know how to set up a church? I can tell you how to do it. I've set up three of them from nothing. 
And I've worked for years in rescue missions, full-time evangelist, 12 years. And I'm sitting there with this knucklehead getting up there teaching 1,200 preachers. You know what he's talking about? Just talking and talking and talking. Doubling the souls of Christ. And I wrote that thesis. And when, that, when, I, when you write a thesis, you have to have a doctoral dissertation and you have to defend your thesis before a board of doctors. My board was a man named Dr. Whitty and Dr. Payne, Dr. Brokenshire. They were all five point Presbyterian amillennial Calvinists. That's what Bob Jones Sr. had in his staff up there until I graduated. After I graduated, he dumped them and got him some premillennial Baptist, but that's a late move on his part. Anyway, this was 53. The time came to get that PhD. My faculty advisor called me in, Dr. Payne, Barton Payne, and he called me and he said, your thesis is not satisfactory. I said, why not? He said, you don't refer to enough, enough original source references. And I said, that's called the length of the thesis. I said, I've got plenty of first source references, original references in the 20th century. I had to resort to secondary sources for back in the first, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh century. He said, well, that won't do. It has to be academic and highly scholarly. And I said, uh, well, did you write a thesis? And he said, yes. I said, let me see your thesis. So Peyton took, Dr. Barton Payne took out his thesis. It was a thesis to prove that First Samuel uh, in the uh, Coptic comes from the Septuagint instead of the Hebrew. I looked for the thing, you know, I had a bunch of language there, German, French, Spanish, Coptic, Arabic, Syriac in it. And I said, see me like your, your thesis doesn't meet the standards of Bob Jones University. He said, why not? I said, why, Bob Jones Sr. said this university has two standards. One academic, one practical. I said, your thesis doesn't look very practical. And Barton Payne said, well, a thesis is just the beginning of a life work. It's the foundation upon which you can build. He said, for example, you might take up next uh, Second Samuel. And I said, I fail to see the practical relevance of that. Well, I left. And when the time came to defend that thesis, Barton Payne wouldn't show up. And Whitty wouldn't show up. And Broken Shire was sick down the hospital, dying. And so when the old man called for the defense of the thesis and three of his faculty members didn't show up, he got suspicious. And he called in Whitty and put him on the carpet. Then he found out what he had there. Whitty had been teaching the students not to ask anybody if they were saved. Because you were elected from eternity, so you couldn't possibly know when you were saved. And then he found out what Payne had been doing. You see, when you start getting two and 3,000 people in the school, you can't keep track of what you are doing in that school. Don't you think you can? Because you can't. And he didn't know what he had back there. He had, a, he had a rat's nest back there. And he called in Payne. You know what he found about Payne? Payne had been flunking all of his class members in order to try to flunk me and couldn't do it. Payne, for two years, had been given tests where the highest score was 65. That was my grade. And the rest of them were 35 and 40 and 45. And the bird had been had to grade on a scale in order to get the class through. He found out about that. So he shipped Payne, then shipped Whitty, and then he went down to Brokenshire, and Brokenshire was dead. He got down there the, you know, the, in the you know, hospital, and Brokey was dead, lying in the bathroom dead, and he'd been grading some cards, filling out report cards on his table there before he died, and the last card he filled out was my card. And I had Ruckman on there, and then he had a note. This man can teach Hebrew. It was on the back of that note. And Bob Jones Sr. found Brokenshire and found that note. So Senior called me and put a lot of pressure on me to stay. Plenty of pressure. All kinds of pressure. But I was sour. I was sour in Junior. I knew if I stayed, I could never get along with Junior. Putting me in a cage with Junior would be like putting Larry Zonk in a cage with Tiny Tim, man. It just wouldn't work. <laughs> and that fellow was just too effeminate for me. I mean, I don't say he's a fruit, you know, but, but just, I mean, uh, you know, just, you know, limp wrist. <laughs> and we'd have never made it, so I didn't, I didn't go. And you know what happened? Because that dissertation was held up, I didn't get my degree for another year. I had to come back the next year to get my degree and came back and got it. And when I got it, lo and behold, I found two premillennial Baptists had been substituted there for the Presbyterians. And so to this day, Bob Jones University is an interdenominational school that pretends to be premillennial. It's not premillennial. 
Every morning at 10 o'clock in the creed, they stand up and they say, I believe in the inspiration of the Old New Testament, the creation man, direct act of God, the incarnation, virgin birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to die in the man kind by shedding blood on the cross, to be salvation by grace and everlasting life, period. There's no statement on eternal security, no statement in the local church, no statement in baptism, and no statement in the millennium, and no statement in the tribulation, no statement in the second coming. But it's an interdenomination. Assembly of God, Church of God, Methodist, Lutheran, Baptist, Pentecostal, Nazarene, that's what you got. That's the mess I got into. And I got in there, what I run into, I run into these great, brilliant intellectuals. You take uh, Dr. Barton Payne, great average, 98 for four years of college and four years of seminary. University of Southern California in Princeton. Brokenshire, Princeton, and Heidelberg, Edinburgh in Scotland and Germany. Could speak, read, and write eight different languages. And one oar in the water and just as nutty as a fruitcake. The bigger the belfry, the more room for the bats. <laughs> Demons have wings, and they're small. Mary Magdalene had seven of them. How could they be angels? They're not angels. Okay. I'll sign maybe one more here. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, this really doesn't have to do with Bible translation, but I got in a discussion of this a couple of months back with the Vice President of the movie, and I, I know I ruined this breakfast, but back in, in the early 1800s, when they got into the Oxford movement and they got into the Tractarians mm -hmm. and the Fussyites, yeah. uh, Cardinal Weissman and Newman, yes. guys, uh, was that thing, whole thing brought about? Is there any record of it? Just, that you can point to about uh, money coming in from the Vatican that made these guys change their mind and a lot of the professors turn turned down. No, you have no, you have, I, there's no proof I've ever seen that, that money was behind that. Although the Bible said the love of money is the root of all evil, and there certainly was a thing there, was certainly evil. All you could say is that the thing that motivated that from a monetary standpoint would be by turning out this new version, RV, they'd sell it by the million and make money off it. But I've never found any proof of that. Does Chick profess to have anything on that? I don't know, but I was in, uh, I was in the deep foundation business for years, and there was one company that dominated this worldwide. And you ran into, in defending these guys, you ran into every professor you ever wanted to see, and there were more, uh, there were more degrees than you could shake a stick at. Uh -huh. And I happened to correct papers for one of these guys and, and, uh, when I was in college, and I saw these checks coming into him. They were, this was back in 1946 for $4,000 a month. That was a lot of money in those days. Yes, it was. Every place I ran into these guys across the country, it was the same thing. And I just, I just have had a gut feeling. Well, maybe. Into the books of, uh, well, maybe you're right. The Lockman Foundation. Well, and, uh, and, uh, yeah. Any, a, lot of, a lot of seminaries. Yeah, maybe you're right. I don't have any proof on it, but the Bible says the love of money is root of all evil. So it probably it might be it might be true. Now, from a biblical standpoint, here's what's happening biblically. You have Ephesus, and then Smyrna, Pergamus, Thyatira, you know, Sardis, uh, Philadelphia, Laodicea. You have these seven churches, and this thing here, this Laodicean thing is roughly about 1900 and this Philadelphia thing is about 1500. And what you have here is a thing that goes like this. And then Martin Luther. And then the RV. <laughs> down like that. And that course, and that course there is a, is a course with a sudden drop off at Lay of the Sea in Revelation chapter 3. So whatever the motive is behind that, it's prophesied it's going to take place. Now, as to, as to what brings it about, I don't know. But that thing with the Pusheites and all that stuff, that Oxford movement is moving back to Rome where the Church of England began to train Catholic priests. The Catholic priests were sent over from Dewey Reeves, France, and put in Oxford and Cambridge and trained as Episcopalian ministers. And when they were asked why they to justify that, they said, I'm all things to all men, the ball means I might save some. And they got in there, and that RV thing is a restoration of a Roman Catholic Bible. So the Vatican could have had a buck in it. But I wouldn't know what the evidence for it is. You had one. Could you explain what the Pope is and 
Jeremiah 10, that passage there in the Christmas tree, and the grove will be way back in uh, way back in Genesis, probably uh, before the law. The high places are. Uh, I think Abraham's connected with one. Uh, somebody find me the word grove in Genesis before the law. I don't have a concordance here. I don't have it marked. So I haven't got it. But uh, if you got a if you got a concordance, there ought to be a reference in uh, uh, 2133. That sound like it. That's still under uh, that's still under uh, Abraham. Yeah, there it is. And Abraham planted a grove in Beersheba and called there in the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. Now later that stuff is condemned under the law, that business, that grove. And the two things Abraham does before the law that God uh, accepts that are forbidden by the law. The first one is the grove, and the second one is offering a offering in a high place. But this comes from much earlier. Come back to Genesis chapter, Genesis chapter uh, 8. And notice the worship of God in a high place begins with Noah. Because, boy, if ever a fellow set up an altar in a high place, he set up an altar in a high place, he sets his altar up something like 14,000 feet in the air. And then from then on, from time immemorial, from then on, it becomes a habit to get in a high place to worship God. And the idea behind that, uh, kind of, the idea behind that is that uh, the higher up you get, the closer you get to God high places. Uh, that's why all these countries have these sacred mountains. Mount Everest and Fujiyama and all that stuff. And that thing is in Genesis chapter 8, when Noah gets out of the ark, verse 18, 20, he builds an altar to the Lord. And that thing is 14,000 feet in the air. So if men on to have a habit of sacrificing in high places, and Abraham plants the grove. All right, now come to Deuteronomy 16, and here's, the, here's how it's forbidden under the law. 16.21, Deuteronomy 16.21. And this is the constant theme of the prophets throughout Kings and Chronicles when they go into apostasy in Israel and Judah. Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 21. Thou shalt not plant thee a grove of any trees near to the altar of the Lord thy God, which thou shalt make thee. Neither shalt thou set thee up in any image which the Lord thy God hateth. Now, you Yankees up here, you have a much better chance to see this than Southerners do. Although we see it a good bit around Huntsville, Alabama, and New Orleans, and a few places like that. But up here, you drive around, I bet you know a dozen places you drive somebody's house, by somebody's house, and there's a statue of Mary sitting out in that yard, or Joseph, or some jerk, and it's sitting out there, and then there's a bunch of trees, bushes planted around it, especially the Catholic hospital. Now, that's the stuff that's forbidden. Uh, one of my friends, Ford of a saved, used to go around and knock heads off those statues, and then laugh at them, say, what's the matter, Mary, did you lose your head? <laughs> And one, one time he stole a statue of Mary and stuck it in a drawer in a dresser in his house and wrote the Lord a note and said, Dear God, if you don't send me what I want at Christmas time, I'm not going to give you back your mother. I'm keeping her. <laughs> yeah, this, this, this bottom drawer. <laughs> now those statues sitting around with a, with a grove around them, that's what's forbidden. All right, in Deuteronomy chapter, or Jeremiah chapter 10, this is not said to be a grove, but it is a tree which could be cut out of a grove. And he says this, 10-2, Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the sign of the heathen, for the heathen are dismayed at them. For the custom of the people are vain, for one cutteth a tree out of the forest, the work of the hand of the workman with an axe. They'll on, so be on sale now in the next three months, three weeks. They deck it with silver and with gold. They spray them sometime with silver and gold. They hang gold and silver tinsel on them. And they fasten with nails with the hammers that it move not. You have a little base down there you put the tree in. And they upright as the palm tree, but speak not. They must either be born because they cannot go. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, neither can they do any, do any good. So that's the thing there, which was why some ultra-separated Christians don't have any Christmas tree in their home, because of Jeremiah 10. Now, there's a couple things about that. Look at the end of verse 5. They're neither good nor bad. 
Paul says, Paul says, though there be many that are called lords and gods, but to us there is but one God, the Father, and one Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says, we know we have knowledge, and we know that an idol is nothing in this world. That is, it's, it's nothing. The tree is just a tree. So it isn't going to kill you. <laughs> And the second thing about it is, verse 2, they're dismayed at the signs of heaven, and you're not. And the, they're worth putting this thing up here to worship it. That's an entirely different thing. Now, if you want to be ultra-separatist, you can say, well, I'm not going to do anything the heathen do and follow their custom because it's a heathen custom. Well, okay, then go to work on Christmas Day. I mean, I have people write me and say, Ruckman, how come you observe Christmas? Because it's a national holiday. Romans 13, 1 to 4. How's that? <laughs> and they get real. Now, we, we, we put a Christmas tree in the church. We don't have a Christmas tree in our church, but our church were peculiar anyway. We don't have an American flag. We don't have a Christian flag. And we don't have a... I don't see how one of them either, you know. How many last Sunday or a week ago or a month ago or the off of that. We don't have that either. We don't have nothing in our church like that. And so we're kind of, you know, we're kind of oddballs. But I wouldn't say this thing here prevents you from having a decorated tree in your house. So just uh, like I tell my kids, I tell them, because uh, I kid them about, about Santa Claus coming down the chimney and burning his britches in the fireplace and all that. But around Christmas time, Christmas time is good for one thing, at least at that time of the year, everybody, their mind is turned toward Jesus Christ. That's good. You can take advantage of that. Now, of course, with us, I've got knowledge. I know when he was born. He was born the 23rd of, Dece of September. Not the 25th of December. So when September comes, we sing, you know, way in a manger and come, oh, you faithful, everybody gets all screwed up, you know. We, we sing, <laughs> we sing songs about the resurrection, you know, in August, you know, and sing about Christmas in September. It's nothing to us, you know. I mean, if you're saved, you know, you don't have to go for that kind of stuff. So we're not fanatical about it. We're kind of fanatical about something. But you know what you can do at Christmas time? Now, this is a lot of fun. You get a bunch of young people together and go to a big restaurant where everybody's whooping it up and get you a table reserved there in the middle of the center table. You see about 15 or 20 kids there. And then right in the middle of that thing, when the place is just packed, you all get up and toast. So, you know, all think you're drinking liquor, you know. And you toast and you sing, Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Jesus. Happy. Oh, boy, you talk about turning the place upside down, man. <laughs> I've done that. And that works. That works. So, when it comes to those kind of things, we get a tree for the kids and give them the presents and let them know that uh, the Lord's paying for the presents. And let them know if it weren't for the Lord, they wouldn't have any presents. We do it that way. Yeah. Five minutes, twelve. Yes, sir. Uh, one last question. We got five minutes, twelve. You told us what demons weren't. Yeah. You told us they were look like flying creatures, birds. And... But who are they? Where do they come from? Are they, are they spirit of lost people? Well, for that, I'll give you a classic German phrase. Ich weiß nicht. <laughs> Which means, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know where they come from. I think sometime they're maybe spirits of animals. Turn to Isaiah 34. Isaiah 34. Well, there's a lot. I know, I know what the answers are, but I don't know all the answers are for all the questions that people have about the spirit world. You know, one time in 2 Kings 4, a fellow's upset. And he says, uh, how shall we do, Master, because the city is encompassed about with chariots and horses and great army? And Elisha says to him, Fear not, for they that be with us are more that be with them. And he said, I prayed the Lord open the young man's eyes, and God's opened his eyes. And he sees chariots of horses and, fi uh, horses and chariots of fire round about the city. But they are all the time. You just don't see them. When Elisha goes to Elijah's rapture, he says, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and the horsemen thereof, the fire, the energy, makes his angels, spirits, makes them uh, uh, a flaming fire. The angel goes up in the fire off the altar. That means there's stuff out there all the time that you can't see. And it's a good, it's a good thing you can't see it. Oh. Uh, the Bible says in Job chapter 41, shall not one even be cast down at the sight of him, referring to the devil. In fact, if you could see the devil, you'd pass out. 
I'm going to just figure it out. Suppose you step out this door after we get through here today and look straight up in the air, and you see a great red dragon up there about halfway across the horizon. I mean, with seven heads and ten horns and breathing fire. You check in at the shrink. <laughs> you go crazy. You couldn't believe that thing, what you're seeing, but it's there. You know, sometime you ought to come down south around uh, Pensacola and go to the Gulf area. You don't have to go away to Disney World to see them. They've got Gulf area all around the country now. And those are great big uh, uh, tanks, about as big as this church, the uh, auditorium here, and uh, oh, maybe 20 feet high. And then they have all these samples of sea life all in one place. It's a wild looking thing you ever see in your life. And what the Lord makes is just beyond belief. He makes stuff that just don't make any sense at all. What crazy stuff, you know. Now these are evolutionists say, well, see how Mother Nature made this animal to blend them with this, oh, you crazy cockeye. Listen, this, they're fish there that are red, white, and blue. They don't fit with nothing, man. They stand on like a sore thumb. There's a fish there called a sea urchin that you can't swallow without getting killed. But one fish gets it called a blowfish. <sighs> He blows that thing over and it turns upside down. He eats the soft belly out of the, where, the, where the spines are. Did you ever stop thinking about that stuff? I mean, I know what evolutionist doesn't. That's because he's crazy. But I mean, did you ever stop thinking about that stuff? Why did God make all that mess? What's the point in it? What's the point in making these dizzy looking animals? One of them has a fishing rod out of his head. Honest to God, he has a projection going out of his head with bait on it he catches fish with. <laughs> I can show you a photograph, man. He goes and he has this little vegetation there and come by. What a dumb, stupid thing to make, man. Here's a fish, a flounder. What's he got both eyes on top of his head for? What's the point? You say you can look up. Don't the other fish have to look up? How come they can't look up? Do you, know what, do you know what a mud has? He has a gizzard. There's only one fish in the water, like a bird. He has a gizzard. Well, what's it for? Pizza fire to me. I don't know what it's for. Well, just put it in there. You say they're vegetarian. A lot of fish are vegetarian, but they don't have gizzards. And why do you need a gizzard to eat vegetables anyway? You know what's going on? I know what's going on, but it took me some time to figure it out. I mean... I was out in the woods one day, and I was lying out there in the bushes waiting for some uh, turkey or something, and looking down at the ground, my face about six inches from the ground, I saw these little bugs crawling around on the ground, you know, and going across leaves and stuff. They've been out there doing that for years, you know. Nobody watched them, just had kind of having a ball, you know. You know the stuff, you see a little wild flower out sitting here someplace. What's it out there for? I mean, nobody's going to see it. You say, you saw it. There's all the stuff growing all kinds of places nobody's ever seen yet. There's stuff in the bottom of the water nobody even knows is there yet. That, the Bass Sphere and BB and that bunch and Jacques Lescosto, they haven't photographed that. What's it there for? Nobody look at it. These little bugs crawl around, what they're out there for? You know what, you know what it is? The Lord's a character. The Lord's a character. You know what he does? He just goes like that. So he says, let's see you, let's see you imitate this. Let's see you imitate that. You know, it makes a lot of stuff just sheer whim, caprice. The Lord makes that stuff just for his own pleasure. He makes that stuff just for his own enjoyment. You want to see how many kind of bushes there are? Plants, animals, fishes, birds. Let's see you do that. A man can't do any of it. He can't do any of it. The Lord does that. He just does that to please himself. That's what he does that stuff for. And you get out there and you get, you look in this Gulf Arm, you all this stuff swimming around here, and then you remember that there's water up there. And there's water above the ferment, below the ferment. And we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, or against rule of the darkness world in high places. There's stuff up there. There's stuff up there. If you could see it, you'd pass out. I used to think that DT, like the doctor said, was brain damage, but I'm not sure about that anymore. I used to work in a rescue mission down in Charleston. I never forget one night some fella came there. Boy, he was spooky, man. He'd been on Bay Rum and, and uh, uh, oh, alcohol and, and uh, denatured alcohol and torpedo juice and rifle bore cleaner and anything he hit his hand on for about a year, I reckon. And he came there and, boy, he went berserk one night and he sat up there in that bed and began to scream. You go to that berth for three city blocks. We called the police and got him down there and got him the tomato juice and black coffee treatment and brought him back. I told him the next day about it, and I said, what did you go off, sound off like that for? He said, didn't you see them bats, them bats? 
I said, Norton, no, see them bats? He said, well, Ruffman, he said, you know what is downtown? I said, what? He said, there's snakes around there wrapped around them buildings. And he said, they're 10 feet in diameter and have hair all over them. And somebody says, well, it's just his mind going to pieces. I don't know. I don't know. I don't want to get this demon stuff. You're getting in a real strange range. Well, I was here chapter 34, and I hear what I'm saying about, you remember I connect with animals? I'll show you why. Isaiah 34, verse 9. Now, there's no doubt about this context. This context, the lake of fire. And the stream thereof shall be turned into pitch, and the dust into brimstone. The land shall become burning pitch. It shall not be quenched night nor day. It's hell. The smoke thereof shall go up forever. It's hell. From generation to generation shall lay waste. Who be there? Eleven, the birds. The birds. What are they doing in the lake of fire? The cormorant, the bittern, the owl, the raven. Those are unclean birds. They're Leviticus 11. Every one of them is an unclean bird. Verse 13, Thorns shall come upon our palaces, nettles and brambles, the fortress thereof. It shall be a habitation of dragons, owls, wild beasts, wild beasts, the satyr. King James only of them. There are no Bible that says satyr. There are none. If you have any Bible, the King James Bible, there is no satyr. You can't find a satyr. A satyr is half goat and half man. It's a genetic mutation. Teenage mutant needs eternals. <laughs> and the screech owl shall rest there and find herself the great owl, the vulture, birds, 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 the demons. One of those things, an animal mutation, half goat and half man. Like a centaur is supposed to be half horse and half man. Now, I'll give you some good advice, which you may heed or may not heed. See that thing right there? That's the book. If you've got that book, you have access to information no Hebrew and Greek scholar has access to, and that can be proved in court. If you've got that book, you have information you cannot get from any English translation in the world. It's in that book. But it's wild information. <laughs> you take that thing, those mutants. You know what they're doing at the University of Ohio right now, in Ohio State? And Michigan State, is there a Michigan University? Okay, anything from Michigan. And then Pennsylvania, you know what they're doing? Back in the biology lab, they're messing with genetics. You know what they're doing? They're messing with the DNA and the RNA. You know what they're doing? They're messing with that stuff together to put that thing to produce clones and produce a gradual succession of, of organic material from non-organic to organic. That's what they're doing. And all they got to do is make one slip coming through there in a few places. You know what you'll have? You'll have just what was here on this earth in the days of Noah. And some of those things were mutants, as sure as you live and breathe. Now, I'll close with this. Uh, years ago, they put out a movie, a bunch of dopeheads put it out, called Star Wars. And people spent millions of dollars, literally, literally, millions of dollars to watch that paper mache, machine made, uh, wire, animated piece of junk. Millions of dollars. And that thing you know what they had? Got a guy walking along like this, a man, see? A skywalker or walking the sky or something walking along like this. That had something right behind him walking like a man, talking like a man with an animal. You know, chew back your back a chew or something, you come along behind him. And then right behind them was another man, but that was inorganic, that was a machine. And that thing was walking on there like this, you know. I think it was gold. Was it gold? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Too bad they don't know where that came from. But I know. And here's this thing going there like gold, and it's a robot, see? And right behind that is a sure enough slot machine, a fire plug coming on right behind that. And that thing there is just a machine. Now, don't you see what they're doing to you? They're trying to make you think you came from rocks. The earth comes out of the sun and smoke and lava and cools the rocks. And the rock comes the mineral. And the mineral comes the machine. And from the machine comes the robot. And the robot comes the animal. And from the animal comes the human. And they're all kin. One earth, global day, I have a happy globe. New earth, take care of the dirt. <laughs> that's what you're getting into. All right, brother, I guess that's enough for one day, 12 o'clock. Yes, sir? <laughs> sir? That Bible bookstore down in uh, Pensacola. 
Uh, if you got any of my stuff, the address will be on there. If you got any tapes or videos, it'll be on there in the back of that thing. They got them too? Okay. Yeah, that'd be a lot quicker over Livonia. Yes, sir. Now, in, uh, in, this is a question, basically an observation. In Genesis, it says the sons of God came into the daughters of men. And then later on in the chapter, it says all flesh had corrupted itself. Uh -huh. Could those sons of God have, uh, have intermingled with animals? Yes, sir. And the, yes, those animals, the spirits, would become demons, or that could be as a mixture of that. That could be. Come to Leviticus. I'll show it to you in Leviticus, <laughs> Leviticus chapter twenty. Yeah, undoubtedly that kind of stuff went on. When he said all flesh should include the animals. Like you know how it include, you know how you know include the animals. God drowned all the animals. You know how you don't include the animals? Because when David got those seeing horses, you know what he did? He cut the hocks in those horses. You say, why? So they couldn't stand up in the hind legs. See? I mean, you see, if all you've got is this book, you've got access to information that no unsaved PhD has access to. Leviticus 11, verse 15, uh, 20, verse 15, If a man lie with a beast, he shall be put to death, and ye shall slay the beast. And if a woman approach to any beast, and lie down there too, thou shalt kill the woman and the beast. So the, the animal goes too. They shall surely be put to death, the blood shall be upon their head. I'll be upon them. Now, did they do these things? Verse 23, and you shall not walk in the manner of the nation which I cast out before you, for they committed all these things. Who were they? The Hamites. Yeah, sir. You know why God told me to come there and said kill them all and kill the babies and kill a whole bunch of them? Because that's what they were doing. That's why I told them to kill them. Capital punishment. Okay, all right, that's all for this morning. Come ahead. Father, we thank you for the day. We're grateful for the opportunity of looking.